looking up against you with greasy hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, loving like Jesus, and it's, it's based, the whole series is based on these two verses. It's uh, Luke chapter 15, it's the preamble to Jesus um, teaching the three parables, uh, the lost uh, sheep, the lost coin, and, and the lost son. And, uh, and it's prompted by what happens in these two verses. Now the tax collectors and sinners, which are great guys to look at in Scripture, um, you know, they, Jesus hung around a lot with them. And they were all drawing near to hear him, Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes, that's another great group to look at, merely because, wow, they're so unlike Jesus, <coughs> grumbled, saying, this man, Jesus, receives sinners, he welcomes them, and he even eats with them. And that was just horrible in Jesus' day. For those who were in our Bible study earlier, you know, I shared how Jews were very racist. Uh, if they went to the marketplace and a Gentile was the, the market um, person they bought some food from, if they were forced to buy from a Gentile, um, they would buy food that could be peeled, that they could rip the rind off of, because as a Gentile, you were filthy, you were disgusting, you were nasty, and they had to rip your nastiness away from their food. So they would only buy, you know, like, you know, if they had oranges back then, they would only buy oranges, you could peel those off. That, that's pretty racist. But now here's Jesus, uh, he takes these unclean people, these sinners, <coughs> And he eats with them, and just imagine Jesus at his table, leaning on his left arm, his feet stretched out, and uh, right next to him is Matthew, the tax collector. Now, that's not very proper in those days, so you got it. Today we're going to talk about being accessible, and uh, uh, we do depart from the rest of the churches in this. I chose a different passage. I think of this. Probably is the best passage for showing Jesus' accessibility with a sinner. So Luke chapter 19, the first 10 verses. <clears throat> and just for setting, you need to know this. Timeline, it's, it's good to just understand your Bible chronologically. And for timeline, Jesus is on his way to Jericho, I mean to Jerusalem. What's getting ready to happen is he will enter Jerusalem and he will have them lay palm fronds in front of him. And they'll, shy, they'll shout out encouragement to him just a week later. Just a little over a week from this point right here. Uh, they condemned him to die. They shouted out, crucify him. Uh, he's been uh, tortured on a cross, buried, and he's going to resurrect on uh, that that Sunday. And this Jericho meeting that he has is on his way to that destiny, to that point in his history. And he's going through Jericho, and, and the reason he went through Jericho in those days was, again, the Jews were so racist. If they were coming from Galilee, they hated the Samaritans so much, and I'll try and reverse this for you guys because I'm picturing it this way. But here, here is Galilee, and here's the Jordan River, and down here is uh, Judea, and it's Jerusalem, and Jericho lies just to the east of Jerusalem. They, would, they hated the Samaritans severely. Rather than take the mountain pass that took them down to that area, they would cross over the Jordan River, they would go down on the opposite side of the Jordan, and then they would cross back over through Jericho. And by the way, there were a lot of things that happened there. Um, thieves loved to lay in wait for people as they traveled through. Um, because it was a trade route, uh, it was also a great place to pay your taxes, which we'll talk about in just a second. And Jericho was just, it was a hub. It was the centerpiece of a lot of travel, as people either came from the east side of the Jordan, uh, trying to avoid the uh, dirty Samaritans or uh, traveling from the east side of the Jordan if they were coming up from points east or they would 
travel through Jericho if they were taking that mountain route up through Jericho when points north. You know, if that, none of that travel exceptions mattered. So you got it? Here's Jericho. So he entered Jericho and was passing through. Something to remember. And behold, there was a man named, you remember this guy? You probably sang him when you were sang his story when you were a little kid. His name was Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. Now, some of your translations may say he was a chief publican. Let me explain to you how this worked. Tax collectors were really, truly franchise owners. The Roman government would come in and say, hey, we need to collect taxes in this area. Who, uh, who wants to bid on this? Uh, we need X amount of dollars. Uh, and, and so this is what we need from you guys. Who's willing to do it for what price? That sort of thing. And the tax collectors would then collect those taxes, but they would have their own upcharge on it so they could make some money off of it. And a lot of times they gouge people. A guy who was a chief tax collector had a lot of other tax collectors that were working for him. And what have I already told you? Jericho is a major, major thoroughfare. It's a major trade route. So when it says that Zacchaeus was rich and that he was the chief tax collector, keep in mind, he's in one of the most profitable points on earth at that time. He's a tax collector. He gets to charge whatever he wants. The Roman government just wants their share, and, but he can charge whatever he wants. And then to, to add to it, he had a bunch of other folks working for him. And during the, the course of your travels, if you were born to Jerusalem and you were a Jewish person, guess who you likely either met or talked to on your travels? Zacchaeus. So you got it? You got the setting? And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he heard and came down and received him, what's the word? Joyfully. I wonder why he was joyful. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. Uh, I want you to underline that. They all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a what? Yeah. So here's that theme again. Here's Jesus and he's hanging around with us now. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it, what? Fourfold. Uh, I'm not sure about you, but I think that's a dr pretty dramatic sort of repentant attitude, don't you? And Jesus said to him, Today, what? Salvation has come to this house since he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That, I would say, we need to underline. And one of the things that I, I think the church oftentimes just maybe loses sight of, it's not that we forget it, it's just we get so busy about being the church and serving ourselves and one of the things we forget is we've inherited Jesus' ministry. And his ministry was to seek and save the lost, and nothing has changed. The church exists to seek and save the lost. That's our job. That's what we're supposed to be. But, but this passage teaches us quite a few lessons. And, and so it's what I call the lessons from Jericho. And, and uh, uh, I wasn't used to this being here. So... <laughs> Uh, and so we're going to look at different people in this passage and just see what we can glean from them, some of the things that we can learn from them. And, and the first group that I see that we can learn from is the crowd. They, there's something to learn from the crowd. Have you ever thought about that? We, one of the things we, we just get caught up in, in 
um, and, and I had an email um, discussion with somebody this week. One of the things we get caught in, up in a lot of times is the missed fish. So, so, yes, we concentrate on Zacchaeus, but we forget there was an entire town that did not attend this dinner. They did not do the repentance that Jesus did. And as a matter of fact, they demonstrated some pretty, um, well, some pretty negative attitudes towards Zacchaeus. Uh, they hated Zacchaeus. Okay? They called him a sinner. And you know why, don't you? Now think about it. To them, as a nation, as a people, he's a traitor. This is a guy who's working for the Roman government, and he's doing it to pat his own pocket. And so he's, he's, he's literally taking the food out of the mouths of some of their family because he's just been gouging them for years. This is not a guy to like. And so the crowd is criticizing Jesus, which is one of our first big lessons to learn from the crowd. Uh, and, and hopefully we learn this in ministry uh, because one of our big challenges is a lot of times the crowd just crumbles. And so you have to develop a thick skin. Because he, and here's, here's our challenge in the US of A Christian church. Our, our challenge is democracy. <laughs> Somehow we've got this idea that right, uh, might makes right. That, you know, if, if the crowd is favorable towards it, then it must be right. And yet, time and time and time again in Scripture, we find out the crowd's often wrong. Uh, the crowd voted for the golden calf, right? That's not a good idea. Just so if you don't know the story, it was not a good idea. It did not end well for them. The, the crowd just has a tendency to get some things wrong. And so they're taking and they're looking at Jesus and they're condemning him. This could have been the seed that the Pharisees and the Sadducees used in the next week to take Jesus from being hero on Sunday to zero on Friday. <coughs> Just because he hung out with a sinner. And I'm thinking, that's a pretty good deal. I like the fact that Jesus hung out with sinners. Do you? Because if Jesus hung out with sinners, that means I would probably get invited to the dinner, wouldn't I? And I like that. Because, you know, when I get really honest, and I'm not around you guys, because I lie a lot to you guys now. Uh, I'm not a nice person a lot of times. Just ask my wife. She knows. No, no really. Can't, can't, if we're going to be honest, are, are we all? Leroy, are you? No, no. I won't pick on Leroy. I won't pick on Leroy. I mean, really. Sometimes we're just not all as great as our press release, are we? And so the great thing about Jesus is does hang around with sinners, which means I get to hang out too. Um, I'm gonna, I want you to hold on to this one. I'm going to come back to it. But one of the other things that we just troubled us about the crowd, and this was the email exchange this week, we grieve about our inability to just win a lot of people in our lives over. And it's okay to grieve. But again, I, I want you to hold on to that. Here's what we can learn about Zacchaeus. Anybody's eligible for redemption. You got that? Anybody. Anybody can make it. No sin is too big for God. And, and then you think, well, that's a, that's a no-brainer. No, I, I've met a lot of people in the course of my years who one of their big questions is surely God can't forgive me can he? Because they think about some of the things that they've done and, and just so you know as a preacher you do hang around with some sinners once in a while and, and they're not just church people. Sometimes you hang around with people who carry so much guilt and so much shame because they've made such poor choices in life. That I mean, not just poor choices, I mean life-altering, 
horrible choices, and they conclude that I'm so bad, surely God can't even forgive me. Which really leads us to what happened with Zacchaeus. Did you get the sermon that Jesus preached at the meal in this passage? Did, did you see that? I, I mean, does, it, does, does Luke record this? this uh, he sits down with Zacchaeus. He dips uh, in the bowl and he says, Zacchaeus, I just want to talk to you about just how bad you are. And you need to come to repentance. Uh, isn't it amazing? You take a look at this passage and it appears it may have happened as quickly as just the invite. Because um, Zacchaeus wanted to know who this Jesus was. Surely over the years, three and a half years, he had seen Jesus come through, he heard him preach, and then all of a sudden, the guy who is most hated in his own town, his whole town says and grumbles as Jesus invites uh, himself to Zacchaeus' house. Uh, he probably concluded, yes, maybe I am a pretty bad guy, uh, but I'm going to just wrap myself in my money and feel better about it. And then as soon as Jesus invites himself to dinner, it seems Zacchaeus says, well, you know what? Uh, I'm going to give half of my money away. Uh, we just took offering, by the way. Anybody in here give half their money away? Go ahead, raise your hand if you were one of them. Did you give half of it this week? I'd just like to know. I don't really know. No, I don't really want to know. But Zacchaeus did that. And then he said, if I cheated anybody, I'm going to do what? Four times. I'm not just going to give back what I cheated them out of. I'm going to multiply that by four. That's how much they're going to get. And, and here's the amazing thing and we see happen with Zacchaeus. Uh, again, I want you to hold on to this. All it took, apparently, was the righteousness of Jesus inviting the sinner to a meal. And that was a new month. I have to tell you, that's pretty commonplace. I also during the years have met a lot of sinners who will not enter a church door because they've been judged so harshly by the people on the inside. And so this triclinium is important for this point right here because here is Jesus. He invites himself to Zacchaeus' house and I'm guessing some pretty notable people are going to be there. Probably all the tax collectors that Zacchaeus could round up were at this, and they were seated at these three tables, or reclining at these three tables. And who is in this spot, which by the way, just so you know, this spot was the most important person in the room. Who do you think got that spot at Zacchaeus' house? Jesus. Because he, he looked at the sinner and saw redemption. And Zacchaeus saw himself in that redemption. So guess who likely was here? And so they spent that meal with Zacchaeus putting his head lightly up against Jesus' chest. And he just poured out his life to him. Which really brings us to Jesus. I just find it amazing. I still think this is the most incredible part of this whole story. That the Son of God left heaven. He left the throne room of heaven to come and specifically, I mean, you know, God is omniscient. That's a big word. All it means is he knows everything. They picked the time. He picked long before we were even created, likely. He picked that there would be a day that Zacchaeus 
would be reclining on his chest, and I find that amazing. I think that in itself is one of the greatest things about the story of Jesus, that God in his righteousness loved us so much, he was willing to get dirty for us and hang around with us. Do you not see the glory of that story? Okay. By the way, there, there is one other little point with Zacchaeus. There might be some folks in this room who are Zacchaeus. You, you, you've, you've made some choices that you're ashamed of. You're not all that proud of what you've done in life. And what we need to do if we're as Zacchaeus, is be willing to climb a tree. Because here's the amazing thing about Jesus' story, is he did make himself accessible. The thing we learn from him too is, we're also supposed to be accessible. So here's three big lessons that Jesus teaches us in the midst of making ourselves accessible to love like Jesus. It's tough this day and age. See this? That's the bane of humanity today. A smart farmer will tell you what paid for it. But uh, I, before going into the ministry, I used to sell these things. And, um, and I can tell you, I've seen a lot of evolution in them. Um, what can you do with a smart farmer? And forget the ad on the radio. It doesn't drive for you. Yes, I know that. So <clears throat> you can keep track of your appointments. You can text like crazy. Um, I, I am weird. Yes, I'm an old guy. Just so you guys know, I have Instagram. I have Snapchat. Yes, these old people probably have Facebook, but I've got the cool network apps, right? You got it? Okay, because some of them don't even have email. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Called her out. But it has created a problem for us. Busyness. Well, but there's also another problem. For, for some of us who take and we judge others because they've got these sort of things. Another problem is we just never get out of our comfort zone. We get locked into our own little comfort and we never travel. Jesus goes on this way. I just want you to think about this. He comes, he stays, and then he goes. He's on his way to the most important date in history. Not only for him, but also for us. And he's passing through this town that a lot of people, to tell you the truth, love to avoid if they could have, and they, they couldn't. He passes through this town, and the guy, one of the guys that made it one of the worst towns in, in their living experience was up in a tree, anxious to see Jesus. And so Jesus came, he stayed with Zacchaeus, but then he went on. Do you know what our problem is today? This, or an excuse, or something that just makes us too busy for other people. We do our own thing, but at the cost of meeting a lot of other people. One of the big complaints among a lot of church people is, man, I just don't know any, any non-Christians. And I would say, well, you can't get too much more hanging around with Christians than being a preacher. You know that, don't you? Guess what you have to do? You have to make yourself available for people who don't go to church. So you get out and you stay with them. And then you just need to know the work continues so you go. But you can never do that if you never get out of your comfort zone. So you got it? Here's the come, stand, go. For come, Jesus was on his way to his biggest appointment in his life. Jericho was opportunity. Accessibility requires movement.
say, be aware of divine appointments. They're all around if you just know, like, you're merely willing to open your eyes to them. Be relational. And I, I love folks who make it part of their mission to get out and make relationships with people. And I, I know God gave me a gift for that. And I was a salesman before I went into the ministry. And, and maybe it's part of that gregariousness. I know no strangers. And I'm, I, I have sometimes no filter. So sometimes I'm just willing to just say, hey, you want to be my friend? You know, that, um, yeah, and that's okay. But you, you have to be willing to be with people, maybe even people who aren't like you. So be open. Be available. But here's the most important thing. We've got we to remember this about being a Christian. Uh, we had a really good friend in Montana, Roy Cook. And Roy would, they, I can outgrow it, Roy on this. Roy Cook was from a big family. He stands about this tall. If he entered that building, you would hear him over here. He had a big laugh. Has a big laugh. Uh, big cowboy, big rancher, big guy, big family, Catholic background, and they loved to drink. Boy, did they love to drink. I mean, everything, and, and they, all they needed was a, part, a reason for a party. And so Roy, in his early days, coming to Christ, struggled with the drinking part. He argued with himself. He could go and he could hang with his family because he was going to lead them to Christ. The problem was, uh, they were the ones who were leading him back to the bottom. So he stood up in front of our church in Lewistown, Montana, and he confessed one day. He says, you guys are going to hear this. I rolled my truck last night and ended up in jail. I had to spend the next two weekends in jail, and I should not have done he changed from that point forward because he became a change agent. He didn't go to them and they changed him. Rather, what happened in Roy's life was he realized it needed to be the other way around. So the drinking wasn't the problem. The problem is who leads you. And if Jesus is leading you and you're following him, Folks are going to be drawn to that. They're going to follow you. But if you're being led by people, by your passions, by your flesh, then what's going to happen is you're going to follow people. So you have to be a change agent. And then finally, let's go. There's a job to do, so do it. Um, remember what I said about being the thick skin. You, you just well, we need to keep our eye on the big picture. So, I want to share with you my Zacchaeus. There's two of them. In Montana, one of the ways I made myself accessible was I became chaplain at the drug treatment program. It was part of the prison system of Montana. These guys would come in. It was guys only. It was an 84 beds facility. It was prison. You had to take your stuff out of your pockets. You had to go through the check rooms. You had to go in. And, and I, I'm telling you, it can be a scary place. I stood talking to a guy who was uh, uh, schizoid paranoid. And he's standing there, and he's talking to the clinical psychologist and myself, and we're asking him questions. This is an entrance exam, and he hears voices. Are you hearing voices now? Yes. What are they telling him to do? To kill you. <laughs> but Jesus did. He was on his way to Jerusalem, and what were they going to do? They were going to kill him. So this young man right here, his name is Ryan. It's not a good picture. It's off of his uh, his record. They have a thing called Conweb out there, and you can pull up records on prisoners. And this is Ryan. I, I knew him just a few. Whoop! Back. This is Ryan 
um, a few years back, but not when I knew him. When I knew him, he was an opioid, he still is, opioid addict. And it was rough. I mean, they, um, their physical appearance changes. He was, um, opioids are, they're devastating. Meth is bad, opioids are devastating. And Ryan was part of my Bible study. We would meet faithfully every Sunday morning. Why? It wasn't convenient. I had church. I was preaching in just an hour. But I had to make myself available in this work for those days. And we go in and we have this Bible study. And he was so hungry for God's word. This is his picture now. Next. He's about 37 years old. Like, look at how hard he looks. Um, I've kept track of him. I pray for him on a regular basis. Um, you have to have beef thick skin, but you also have to know how to grieve. Ryan is not a success story yet. So I get email updates whenever his disposition changes. Whenever they, you know, he, he'll... He'll leave MSP. MSP is Montana State Prison. He'll leave there. He'll go into a pre-release program. Given his track record for the last 12 years, he will likely do something that violates him. He'll end up back in the system. And they'll send him either to boot camp or uh, to another treatment program or to prison. He, he now seems that he's mostly just in prison. But I haven't given up on him. If you're going to be available for sinners, you're going to fall in love with them. Because if Jesus' love is in you, you're going to fall in love with them. And I just wanted to show his story. Because not everything is hunky-dory, rosy, great ending. But that doesn't mean you give up. Really. His last chance is going to be whatever God sends his way. But his last chance is just going to be just before his last breath. And I have hope that the God of creation is big enough that he sends the right person Ryan's way. So that's Zacchaeus number one. Zacchaeus number two, I love this guy too. This guy, um, Cass, uh, by the way, girls, do you think he's good looking? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, let's see. Uh, right, this is a good looking kid. This is also his uh, Conwood picture. And um, Cass, I knew. Cass, uh, his mom and stepdad and um, half brother and sister attended our church. Um, Cass did once in a while. But he, he had a lot of problems. He also is addicted to opiates. And. Uh, and boy, did his parents have a problem. I, I happen to know his dad as well. His dad owns a construction business out there in Lewistown. 